Okay, class, in the last um, class session, we started on 2.3, but we weren't able to um, finish 2.3. As a matter of fact, we only got through this first page of content. So we really just basically defined the difference between a relation and a function. Um, but we're going to continue the discussion today on domain, range, um, determining whether relations are functions, which we did a tiny bit of it the last time. We'll talk about function notation, which I kind of mentioned over here when I was talking about it. And then we'll even get to increasing, decreasing, and um, constant functions. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, start. And so last time we left off with these basic rules, and today we're going to continue um, with domain and range. So for this particular problem, it says, um, for every relation consisting of ordered pairs x, y, there are two important sets of elements. The set of all values of the independent variable, which is x, is the domain. The set of all values of the dependent variable, which is y, is considered the range, okay? So for a finite set, okay, so you have two different kinds of sets. You have finite sets, which have a certain number um, of elements, and then you have infinite sets, which are sets that have an infinite number of numbers in them or an infinite number of elements, okay? Um, so here we have a relationship, right? Three is related somehow to negative one, four related somehow to two, so on and so forth, okay? And so if I'm trying to figure out the domain, we have to talk about all the values that are in the independent variable, which is x. Well, this is x, this is x, this is x, and this is x. And when you're writing set notation, you do not have to write repeated values, okay? So for domain, it's a set, so I have to use the little braces to represent a set, kind of like when we were writing our solution set. We were always putting our answers in braces. It's the same sort of thing, okay? So here we're gonna be putting our um, domain inside this set. So these, the elements that I have here are three, four, and six. Those are all the different values uh, for my X variable, my independent variable. When you're talking about the range, you're talking about the Y values. Okay, so in this case, this would be a y, a y, a y, and a y. And so then the values of my range would be all of those elements, two, five, and eight. And since none of them were the same, I did have to list each and every one of them, okay? Similarly, you remember your x represents the first component and your y represents the second component. since also, x represents your input and y represents your output, right? And since I don't have x and y labeled here, I have to use those ideas to label them myself, okay? So something is happening. This would be the function of what's happening to take this number to that number. But since this is the input, these would be the x's. And since this is what happens afterward, this would be the output, which is the y. So when they're asked you for domain in this particular example, it would be all the values in this circle or oval. So it would be four, six, seven, and negative three. And then the range would be all the values in that Y oval, which in this case are just 100, 200, and 300. Similarly for number or letter C, here they're given to us in a table, but it's clearly labeled X's and Y's. So remember domain is the set of the X values, which happen to be negative five, zero, and five. And range is the set of Y values, which happens to be just two. I don't have to write it out three times, okay? You only need to write it out once. Okay. 
Now let's try finding domains using graphs, okay? And so this is where we start to get into um, domain and range as infinite sets, okay? So you see these arrows? That means that they are going and going and going in that same direction and they never stop, okay? Um, also, what's something that's a little mind boggling, okay? But if you were to talk about all the numbers between just one and two, it might sound crazy to say, but it's absolutely true, is that there are an infinite number of numbers in between here, okay? Let's just talk about 0.5, right? 0 0.5 is a different number than 0 0.5. 5, which is a different number than 0 0.511, which is a different number than 0 0.5111, right? And I could keep going on and on and on forever with these decimals, right? There are decimals that do never end, okay? So there are an infinite number of numbers just around this singular number. There's also an infinite number of numbers between one and two, okay? So when even if you don't have arrows, you can still have an infinite kind of um, domain or an infinite set for the range, okay? Now to symbolize an infinite set, we don't use the braces because braces are really for finite sets. For instance, this graph here, I have specifically just four points that make up my graph, okay? So if I wanted to write the domain, I'm literally just going to have four X values and that's it. So when I'm doing that, I am gonna use the set notation with the braces, D stands for domain, and I'm gonna plug in just the X values. So negative one, zero, one, and four. And then when I do my range, that's also a finite set. So I'm going to list these numbers, these Y values. Um, I, have, uh, I have one, two, negative one, and negative three. And so that is my range. And the order in which you put your list um, doesn't matter unless the computer specifically says that the list has to be in a certain order. If they tell me that the order has to be from least to greatest, this is already from least to greatest. If I wanted this one to be least to greatest, it would actually be negative three first, then negative one, then one, and then two. But I don't think they ask you specifically for them to be in a specific order, okay? Now, here we have X values, which is your domain, and Y values, which are your range. So if you notice, there's this is the graph here. Every single dot on the graph is what makes up this solid curve there, okay? So you have an infinite number of points going around and around and around and around and around and around that make that line look like it's solid, okay? So each one of these points, regardless of where it is, let's just say I take one right there it corresponds to a specific X value and a specific Y value, okay? But if I've got gobs and gobs of points all the way around, then essentially what you have is an infinite list of X values. An infinite list of X values are not represented by these sets. They are represented by what are called um, intervals, okay? And in intervals, you basically just tell us where the X values start and then where they stop. Okay. On top of that, we need to have some extra information and that is, excuse me, I have the hiccups. Um, whether or not where it starts at that specific X value, if um, that X value is included in the group in the set, or in the interval, or if that X value is not included in the interval, okay? And so there's a difference. You use brackets when the X value is included 
in the set or in the interval. And then you use parentheses when it's not included. Okay, this is specifically for domain and range. Okay, so how you know if it's included or not included, whether or not it's a solid dot or a solid line, or whether it's an open dot or, an, and there's no open lines, it's just an open dot. Okay, when we get to asymptotes later, those will be like considered open lines, they look like dashed lines, but that's at the end of the semester or like three fourths of the way in. Okay. Um, for now, what I notice is if I'm looking at the domain, since all of these points correspond to X values, notice that all the X values basically run from here all the way to here. And that's symbolized by this gray area, okay? What it's called is transpose. So if I were to transpose every single one of these points onto the X axis, it would fill the X axis from here to here. So for my domain, it would be the interval from negative four to four. Now, since it does have a solid curve here and a solid curve here, I can assume that those are gonna be solid dots that make up that solid curve, okay? So therefore, there's actually a bracket on this side and a bracket on that side. Similarly, we could do the same thing for the range. Remember, as you're moving along this curve, each one of these dots that make up that solid curve do correspond to a specific y value, okay? Even these on this side correspond to the same y values, okay? So if we're looking at this, notice that if we were to transpose every single point on both sides, it would fill up this space from this y value all the way to that y value, okay? And so it does go from negative six to six, okay? And I do have brackets because again, this is a solid curve, which is made up of a bunch of solid dots, okay? So that would be the range. Now, one thing that you do have to know is that when you are doing the stopping and starting of your intervals, this number always has to be the lower number and the stopping point always has to be the larger number. You do not have a choice for that. So if you're doing domain, it does have to be, um, I'm just gonna use a bracket or parentheses, it doesn't matter because I don't know, it depends on the, on the picture, okay? But this would have to be the leftmost X value. I thought I could fit it in there. And then this one would have to be the rightmost X value. Similarly, when you're doing the range, if you have to put the lower y value first, that's going to be um, the lowest y value to the highest y value. Right? Again, I don't know if it's parentheses or brackets or what until I see the actual picture. Okay. So notice that when I did the domain, I used the leftmost x value on the left and then the rightmost x value on the right. And when I did the range, I used the lowest y value and then the highest y value, okay? It does have to be in that specific order in order for it to be considered interval notation. So if I'm looking at this one, notice that it's going in that direction forever because of the arrow. So when it's going that way, it's going slightly left forever and slightly upward forever. And over here, it's going to the right forever and downward forever. Okay, that's what the end is doing. So if I'm trying to find the domain, I want to find the leftmost x value. So if I transpose all of these down onto the line, what is that leftmost x value? Well, if it's going left forever, then there is no specific X value. However, I can tell you where it is going, okay? And if it's going forever in the negative direction, then it's going toward negative infinity.
And the same thing for to the right side, right? Because domain is left to right. This is going to the right forever, but toward the positive direction. So it's going toward positive infinity. Now, here's another little clue we have to know, okay? You cannot include infinity or negative infinity because infinity and inf negative infinity is not a number. It's just a direction, okay? It's going toward that number, going toward the positive direction forever or going toward the negative direction forever, okay? So you must use parentheses around infinity or negative infinity as well as the open dots. Pretty much everything else will get um, the brackets. So if you've got solid dots, solid lines, solid curves, those all get the brackets. Now, but the arrows usually lead to infinities. Now we're gonna do the range. So the range is the lowest Y value up until the highest Y value. But since this is going down forever in the negative Y direction, right? These Y values are negative. Um, it's going to be going forever toward negative infinity for y. And then it's going up forever. So it's actually going toward positive infinity for the y. And we also know that if we have these guys, it should not be included, which means I should represent that by a parentheses. Now for this one, okay? So when I'm doing domain, remember we're doing left to right. So how far to the left does this go? It curves like this. Okay, I'm trying to draw it nicely, but I can't draw it too great. So it just keeps going. It is going up forever, but it's also slightly moving outward forever. And then the same thing with this side. It's going up forever, which is obvious, but it's also slightly moving toward the outside as well, but forever right? It doesn't stop. So if I'm trying to figure out how far left it goes, it actually just keeps going and going and going to the left toward negative infinity. And how far right does it go? It just keeps going to the right forever and ever and ever toward positive infinity. And since we can't include those because they're not actual specific numbers, we're going to use parentheses. Now for range, we're doing the y value. So the lowest y value to the highest y value. Well, this happens to be the lowest part of the graph, okay? And that happens to be the y value of negative three. And the highest y value, well, both of these ends are going up forever. So there is no highest y value specifically, but we do know that it's going up forever, which is in the positive y direction. So that would be positive infinity. Now, we know the infinities cannot be included, but because there was a solid, a solid curve here, you can assume that there exists a solid dot in there. Normally when I try to draw a dot, my dot is larger than the curve that's shown, but really my dot is in that curve, okay? So it's like really smaller. Um, but because it does, it is solid all the way around, we will use a bracket for that one. Okay, now here's a little bit of vocabulary before we get into the next type of examples. So this one says agreement on domain. Unless specifically stated otherwise, the domain of a relation is assumed to be all real numbers, which means everything to the left or downward, or no, we're talking about domain. So everything to the left, all the way to everything on the right, every single number on the x-axis, okay? So all real numbers is the same as saying negative infinity to positive infinity. Um, so the domain is a, of a relation is assumed to be all real numbers that produce real numbers when substituted for the variable, the independent variable, okay? When they say, unless specified otherwise, okay? These other specifications 
are even radicals, fractions, and eventually logarithms. Logarithms is like in chapter four. So it'll be a minute before we get to those. But for right now, we have seen radicals and fractions. Okay. Um, so the condition, if you do see a radical, and a not any radical, an even radical. So a square root, which is an index of two, a fourth root, which is an index of four, a sixth root, which is an index of six. So even indexes are even radicals, okay? So if you do have an even radical, whatever's on the inside of that radical is called a radicand, and that radicand has to be greater than or equal to zero. You cannot take the square root of a negative because then it causes things to go imaginary, right? So that's why we set it greater than or equal to zero to make sure that it's zero or positive. Now, the other, can, the other specification is fractions. We know that with fractions, our denominator cannot equal zero. So, um, and then logarithms, when we eventually get to them, you'll figure out that there's something in a logarithm called an argument, and an argument has to be positive, but it can't be zero. So notice that that one just says greater than zero, but it doesn't have the equal bar, like a radicand. I could take the square root of a zero, that's okay. Um, and I could take square root of anything bigger than zero, positive numbers, and that's okay. What I can't do is take the logarithm of zero, okay? So, but we'll talk about that later when we get to logarithms, okay? I just wanted you to be aware that it is one of these special specifications. So in general, the domain of a function defined by an algebraic expression is the set of all real numbers except those that lead to division by zero or to an even root of a negative number, which is exactly the same two situations that I brought up. Your denominator cannot be zero and your radicand can be negative. It has to be positive or zero. So determining whether relations are functions, you can do that graphically. And in order to do that graphically, essentially what you're doing is you're applying what is called the vertical line test. And in the vertical line test, um, it tells us that if every vertical line intersects the graph of a relation in no more than one point, then the relation is a function. And so I'm sure they're gonna give us some examples to, to try to figure out. So here's the first one. It says, use the vertical line test to determine whether each relation graphed is, is a function. So if, and this is just saying each equation in example three. So if you notice, these are the exact same images that I had in example three when they were asking me for the domain of the range. So if you were to draw any vertical line anywhere, and so I'm just gonna draw a bunch of random vertical lines. And they don't have to specifically be on these grid lines. They could be anywhere. They could be in between the grid lines. It doesn't matter where the vertical lines are. Just imagine that the paper is filled with an infinite number of vertical lines, okay? If you noticed this vertical line, the second one, the third one, and the fourth one do not touch the graph at all, okay? They don't need to. The definition of a function is that it doesn't touch the vertical lines more than once. Notice that this vertical line does touch the function once at this point. This vertical line touches the function once at this point. This vertical line touches the point once, and these don't touch it at all. And then this one touches the function once at that point, okay? But none of these vertical lines ever touch the graph of the function or of the relation um, more than one time. So therefore, this function is a function, or this relation is a function.
Whereas over here, I could draw a bunch of vertical lines out here and they won't touch the graph at all, right? Which is the same situation as what we had in part A. But as soon as I draw one there, all of a sudden I touch it twice. It only takes one line, just one, one vertical line that touches the graph more than once for the whole relation to not be a function. And since, yeah, there's plenty of other lines that will touch the graph more than once, but even just one of them touching the graph more than once means that this is not a function. Similarly here, if I were to draw a bunch of vertical lines, notice that each one only touches the graph one time each. So this is a function. Similarly here, now this one's a little bit weirder to see, but it doesn't matter how many vertical lines I draw, each one only touches that graph once per line. So this one is a function. Another example would have been something like this. Okay. So I think I talked about in the first class, the difference between y equals x squared and x equals y squared. Well, this is the graph of y equals x squared. And if you notice, it passes that vertical line test. So this is a function, okay? Whereas this one fails the vertical line test and this one is not a function, okay? But I just wanted you to remember that because we did say that one was a function and one wasn't but now we have an actual reason why one is a function and the other is not. Now for example five, this one wants us to identify functions, domains and ranges. So it says decide whether each relation defines y as a function of x and give the domain and range. So essentially what you wanna do is you wanna get y by itself, okay? And then if you can get y by itself, then um, you want to make sure that for each x, you get just one y value back out, okay? So for every x that you plug in, you should only be getting one y value back out. So let's look. Here, y is already solved for. Here, y is not by itself. So in order to get it by itself, I would have to take the square root of both sides. But as soon as I do that, I get plus or minus. Okay. Um, and when I do that, guess what happens? If I plug in one x value, right? If I plug in one x value, then what happens here is that um, if I plug in one x value, like let's say I plug in the x value one. When I plug it in, I'm gonna get the square root of one, which is one. But I don't just have one, I have plus one and I have negative one. So I plugged in one x and by doing that, I would get that y equals positive one and y equals negative one. So if I were to actually plug it in, this means that y equals one and y equals negative one. So I plugged in one value for x, but I ended up getting two values for y. So this one here is not a function. And if I talk about its domain, okay, remember the domain of a radical, the whatever's on the inside of the radical um, must be greater than or equal to zero. And I don't need to solve for X because it's already solved for. 
I just need to put this in an interval. If I have zero here and x is equal to or greater than zero, then I basically have a solid dot because it equals zero, and then all of this shaded in, okay? When I have that and I wanna put it into interval notation, this is a solid dot, which means it would be a bracket, and then the x value zero, and it's shaded in, but going forever in this direction, which means it's going toward positive infinity, and we know that positive infinities always get the parentheses. So this would be the domain. If you wanted to figure out what the range would be, um, you really would have to look at the graph. So if I were to draw this, and if I were to plug in zero um, for x here, I would get plus or minus zero. So I plugged in x for zero and I got zero. If I plugged in one for zero, what did I get? When I plugged in one for X, I got positive one for Y and negative one for Y, which means it's actually going like this, which I drew up there, didn't I? Okay. And we know again, because it fails a vertical line test that this is not a function, but having this image actually helps me figure out what the range is. So, um, if I'm figuring out the range, well, how high, uh, how how low does it go? Because range has to go from the bottom to the top, right? The lowest to the highest. So how low does it go? It's going down forever, which means eventually it'll go to the y value toward negative infinity. And then this one is going up forever. So the y value is going up towards positive infinity. And we know that infinity and negative infinity are never included. So they should always have parentheses. Now here, excuse me, this function does not have any, um, any square roots. It does not have any fractions, no logarithms, none of those three things, right, that we needed to be looking out for. And the y is already solved for, so I can look at x plus four, okay? And it doesn't have any radicals and it doesn't have any fractions. So when that happens, then you have to assume that the domain is automatically going to be negative infinity to infinity. Also, we know from previous class, right, how to graph this. If this is a coefficient of one, remember this is your y-intercept and this is your slope. So my y-intercept is at four. And my slope is one. So I got to go down one unit and over one unit. And all you need really is two points to graph a line. And so I have that line. Well, isn't it going to the left forever and to the right forever? But if I'm trying to figure out the range, it's also going downward forever toward the negative y values. And it's going up forever toward the positive y values. So we do have that range as well. Now for part B, this is one of those special specifications, okay? So here we know that for radicals, whatever's on the inside cannot be negative because then it goes imaginary, right? So it has to be greater than zero, which means positive, or it could equal zero because zero is not negative either, okay? Then I had to solve this. So if I add one to both sides, I will get 2x greater than positive 1, and then divide by 2, I get that x is greater than or equal to 1 half. So what does that mean? That means when I'm drawing this, I have to start by plugging in the x value 1 half, and then I can plug other numbers in there. Um, maybe like, um, let's see, to the right would be... I don't know, one, and then we'll go a little bit further out and put four, something like that, just to get a few uh, points to figure out what's going on. So when I plug in a one half, let's see what we get. Square root of two times one half minus one. What do I get when I plug in a half? I get zero. So essentially what's happening is I plugged in one half and I got zero. 
So there's a point at one half and zero. What happens when I plug in one? Square root of two times one minus one. I end up with the y value of one. What happens if I plug in four? I get square root of seven. I don't know where that is on the graph, so I'm gonna hit turn it to a decimal, but I get approximately 2.6, okay? And so then that lets me know how to graph this. Uh, one, two, three. So one half and zero is here. One and one would be there. And then four and 2.6 would be just a tiny bit more than half between two and three. Okay, and so then now we see that this is going in this direction and it is going like this. Okay, so it has a curve. I know I'm not using graph paper, so it doesn't look really, really nice, um, but it is going like this. If you had more points other than just one half, one and four, you would be able to see better what it looks like. Okay, but it does look like this. Um, if I had drawn it really pretty, it would have looked like that, okay? And that's what, that's what a square root function should look like. We'll talk more about what a square root function should look like when we get to, um, I believe it's chapter two, like later in chapter two. Right now we're at the very, very beginning of it. Um, so if I look at this, I can really determine what the domain and the range are. The domain would be from this x value going forever to the right. So from one half forever in the positive direction, but because there's a solid dot there, I will put a bracket. And then the range, the lowest y value is here. Well, that y value corresponds to zero, but it's going up forever little by little. So it will go up toward positive infinity for y. This one will always get a parentheses, but since there is a solid dot at this y value of zero, it will get a bracket. Now, moving on to this one. So y is already by itself, but notice that it is not equivalent, okay? So if I were to plug in an x value, let's say y, let's say I plug in x equal to one, I get that y is less than or equal to zero. So I plugged in one x value and I got y less than or equal to zero, which means y could be zero, y could be negative one, y could be negative 0.5, y could be any number less than or equal to zero. So I plugged in one x and I got a whole bunch of numbers back out, right? This is not a function. And, I, and I'm, I'm not gonna do this one only because the way they worded these directions is not the same as the way that they word the directions in the homework. In the homework, it says, if it is a function, then give the domain. If it's not a function, then just state that it's not a function. So for this particular problem, I wouldn't have had um, to, to do the domain at all. I would have just needed to write that it was not a function, okay? This one is a function, doesn't it pass the vertical line test? And this one is a function, it also passes the vertical line test, okay? So for these two, I needed to give the domain. But for this one, since it's not a function, we don't need to give the domain. This one's gonna be a little bit harder to explain, only because we have not talked about uh, fraction functions yet, and we won't get to that until we get to chapter three and actually more toward the end of chapter three, okay? But for now, what we do know is that our denominator cannot equal zero. So if I add one to both sides of this inequality, I get that x by itself cannot equal positive one, okay? So that means on the number line, from negative infinity to positive infinity, I can have any of these numbers, x can be any of those, just not zero. 
which means that at zero, there's actually an open dot at zero, okay? And how do I represent that in an interval? Because there's obviously an infinite number of numbers this way and that way. So for this problem, our domain would be from negative infinity to the zero. And because it's an open dot, it would have a parentheses. So this represents this half of the number bar. The other half of the number bar would be from zero to positive infinity. Again, an open hole gets a parentheses and an infinity gets a parentheses. Now to tell the reader that both of these pieces are your interval, you use what is called a union symbol in between. So it tells the reader that this and this together make up the whole domain. The range is what's gonna be a little bit weird to try to figure out. So if I know that X cannot equal zero, well, I'm gonna plug in other numbers besides zero. So I'm gonna plug in um, positive one and negative one, but then I'm also gonna plug in numbers that get closer to zero, okay? Mm -hmm. On the left and on the right. So maybe 0 0.5, maybe 0 0.1, and then negative 0 0.1, negative 0 0.5, and then negative one, okay? And let's see what we get when we plug those in. So five, oh, not zero, why did I say zero? So X cannot equal one. So there should be a hole where X is one. So then my domain would be the left side of one and then the right side of one. So these are not the right numbers. So what I want to do is I want to plug in a number like zero and two. So zero and then get closer. So like 0.5 and get even closer, like 0 0.1. And then I want to plug in two and then get closer in between would be like 1.5 and even closer would be like 1.1. Okay. So I want to see what I get when I plug these in. So the function is five over X minus one. So five over zero minus one, it gives me negative five. Um, five over 0 0.5 minus one, that gives me negative 10. Five over 0 0.1 minus one. This gives me, did I do that right? negative 5.55. Okay, then five over two minus one. That gives me five. Five over 1.5 minus one. That gives me 10. And then five over 1.1 minus one. That gives me 50. Yep, that's right. Okay, so if I draw this, and I'm going to try to draw it, I'm going to erase this one. Since it really wouldn't have even asked me for domain and range, I really wouldn't have had to draw it. So I'm going to erase this graph and draw this graph over here. So zero and negative five would be down here. Um, 0.5. This is gonna be 0.5 and that would be negative 10. And then 0 0.1. And I don't see, I don't feel like this is right. Right here, oh, it's not right. So I'm getting closer to it, not further away. So if I'm here in the middle at 0 0.5, if I wanna get closer to one, I should actually be at 0 0.9, right? That's why this one was not making sense to me. Okay, so five over 0 0.9 minus one is actually negative 50. Now, that's what I was trying to see, but I didn't understand why I was seeing it. 
So going close, right? Zero, then halfway is about 0 0.5. And then real close to one would be 0 0.9. Same thing here, two, and then halfway would be 1.5. And then real close to that would be 1.1. So when I plug in uh, 0 0.9, nine, it's actually negative 50, which is like way down there somewhere, okay? Mm -hmm. If I connect these dots, this one's doing this, and this one's doing this, okay? Then if I go over here and I plug in um, two, I get 50, which is like way up there somewhere. Uh, when I plug in 1.5, I get 10, which is about here somewhere. And when I plug in 1.1 right there, I get about five. So this one is going, um, oh, I did it backwards. What am I thinking? Come on. So when I plug in two, I get five. And then when I plug in 1.5, I got 10. And then when I plug in 1.1, I got 50, which is way up there somewhere. So the graph is actually going up to there and then it's going this way for this one, okay? So if you try to do the range for this one, notice what it's doing. It's going down forever, but then it goes up to here and it never quite touches the x-axis. Well, what is the y value on the x-axis? The y value on the x-axis is zero. So it goes from negative infinity to zero, but it never touches the y-axis. So you don't include the zero. Similarly, it goes from here, it's going down, 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 but never ever touches the y-axis. So it never quite touches the y value zero, but then it goes up forever and ever and ever toward the positive y. So it goes, up to positive infinity, okay? But that you would not be able to tell just um, looking at the function. You would have to figure out what the graph is doing. And if I plug, plug in numbers even closer and closer to one, like 0 0.99999, this number is gonna get super large, which will make it obvious that it's going to negative infinity. And then it'll be a negative number, but like big, 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 sort of. 5 over 0 0.99999 minus 1. Look at how big that number is, right? It's going down toward negative infinity. Whereas if I pick a number closer and closer and closer to 1, like maybe 1.00000001, that's real close to 1. So 5 over 1 point minus 1. Again, a really big, large number, but it's in the positive direction. And so that's how I know it would be going to positive infinity. Okay. Now, let's see what this box says. So this box says a function is a relation in which for each distinct value, um, of the first component of the ordered pairs, there is exactly one value of the second component. That was the first definition we learned for a function. And then number two says, a function is a set of ordered pairs in which no component is repeated. I mentioned that to you, right? It was just another way of saying this. And then the third one is, a function is a rule or correspondence that assigns exactly one range value to each distinct domain value. And that's the same thing as applying the vertical line test, right? So for each line, it should only have one value for that X value. If it has two values, two Y values for that singular X, then it's not a function. Now we're on, I believe, this is now going to get into the function notation. Um, so for function notation, I did kind of already briefly mention that at the first, in the last class period. So it says when a function f is defined with a rule or in an equation using x and y for the independent and dependent variables, we say that y is a function of x. 
To emphasize that y depends on x, we use the notation y equal to f of x. Or f of x is the same thing as y, OK? So y is the function value's output. x is the value that's plugged into the function. That's the input, OK? f is like the operator of the machine that is doing something to the x and then spitting back out a, a, a y value, OK? So um, this f of x is called function notation. Um, and to express this, you read f of x as f of x or f at x. So you're finding the y value at that specific x value. Now it says, note that f of x is just another name for the dependent variable y, OK? Um, and sometimes they can change that letter. f is not always the default. Um, if you have two functions involved, right, they might want to call one of the functions Frank and the other function Gary. And so you might see letters like F and then G, but that's just so that they can talk about multiple functions. They don't always have to use the F. It can be any letter. Um, and then it says the symbol F of X does not in no way indicate F times X. It does not mean that. And that is going to be the biggest misconception in this section is that people think that this says G times X and it doesn't. What it does is it tells you G is the operator for X, and this is the operation that you'll do to the X to compute the Y value, okay? So you have to be very, very, very careful with that, okay? F, G, H, K, whatever letter they use is the operator that's being done to the X value. And they even tell you what is going to be done to the X value. So they're saying the function that's happening here is this, okay? And if you give me an X value, I can plug that X value in and I'll be able to compute the Y value for you, okay? So when they ask me F of two, what they're saying is that, um, remember, F of anything equals the Y value. So if I say F of X equals the Y value, they're telling me that the two is X and they're asking me to figure out this Y value, okay? Well, if I know that two is the X, then all I'm gonna do is look at the F function because that's the one they're telling me to look at. Look at the F function. And since there's this X got replaced with the two, you're gonna replace all the X's with the two. So it'll be two squared, and then five times two minus three. And always, I think I've mentioned this before, is when you plug in numbers, always put them in parentheses. Don't forget to put them in the parentheses. You can get wrong numbers if you do forget to put stuff, certain things in parentheses. But instead of trying to memorize when you can and when you can't, just always do it. So when I do the square first, I actually get four. And I'm doing my orders of operations. So you have to apply your exponents first, then your multiplication. So a negative times a four, positive four is a negative four. Five times a two is 10. And then finally, I can do my add and subtract from left to right. So this is six minus three, which is just three. I could have also entered this whole thing. So if I had, I would have cleared out. Let me negative parentheses two square plus five parentheses two minus three, and it would tell me the same value, three. Remember, this is a y value, okay? Same thing here, if they want me to do f of q, I'm going to apply this function to see what I get. So I'm gonna replace all of my x's with the q. So this is negative q squared plus five times q minus three, um, I can't really simplify that other than to square the Q, which is Q squared, multiply the five in the Q, which is five Q. And there's really nothing else I can do, but this does represent the Y value, which is what you're asked to do when they ask you for F of a number or F of an expression. Similarly for this one, we have G of A plus one. So now the X value in there is A plus one. So I'm going to replace this x with a plus 1. But again, it must be in parentheses. 
And since I have a two times two terms, I'm going to distribute that. And I get 2a plus 2. I do have some like terms I can combine, so I get 2a plus 5. And I can't simplify this anymore, but this does represent the y value, okay? But this is what they're asking you for and what you will type in the box. So they give you the x value in parentheses to plug in, and then you do what you can, and whatever you end up with, that's the y value, okay? I think we're going to stop here, though. Um, oh, we can do this one. This one's not too bad, but we will not have time for the increasing, decreasing, and all that. So here it says find f of 3. Remember, f of x equals y. So the x value is this 3. So if I want to find f of 3 in this function, I'm just plugging in 3. Multiply first, subtract last, I get 2. Here, though, I'm trying to find, I know that the x value is 3, but what I'm wanting to know is the y value. Well, this is the point that has an x value of 3, and what is its y value? It's 1. So f of 3 is 1. Same thing here. Here's where x equals to 3, but that touches the graph here. And what is that y value? That y value is 4. So in that case, f of 3 is actually 4. The y value is 4. And we don't have any problems like this particular one. Um, but we won't have time to get into the increasing, decreasing, and constant functions today. Um, or actually, we might be able to. It's the last thing in this section. So I'm actually going to cover it. I think I still have about 15 minutes or a little less than 15 minutes. So we'll cover this one. So increasing, decreasing, and constant function says that um, suppose, suppose that a function f is defined over an open interval. Open interval means that they don't use brackets. So we'll always have parentheses. Always, always, always. That's what open interval means. No brackets whatsoever. So when you're doing domain and range, you can have brackets depending on if it's solid or open, right, or per infinities. But when you're doing increasing, decreasing, and constant intervals, they always have to have parentheses. That's very important because the computer will count you wrong if you put brackets when they're asking you for intervals of increasing, decreasing, or constant. Domain and range, put the brackets where they belong. But for uh, intervals of increasing, decreasing, and constant, no brackets whatsoever. Okay. Um, so this is a mathematical way to say it. Okay. What I will mention to you is that this is just saying that you have to read the x values from the leftmost x value to the rightmost x value. So read the graph from left to right. I trace the graph from left to right and then figure out what's happening. If it's going up, it's increasing. If it's going down, it's decreasing. And if it's just going straight, like flat, then that's considered constant, okay? So it says, decide what a function is increasing or decreasing or constant over an interval. Ask yourself, what does y do as x goes from left to right? Our definition of increasing, decreasing, and constant function behavior applies to open, open intervals of the domain, not to individual points. So what that means is if it's intervals of the domain, that means these intervals use x values only, not the points. So not x's and y's. It's just the x values, OK? So not only do they have to have open parentheses, but you do not use the y values at all when you're talking about this. You look at the y values, but you don't write the y values in your answer. OK, now, again, if you're looking at it from left to right, if it goes up, it's increasing. If it goes down, it's decreasing. If it's not going up or down at all, it's just staying the same y value, then it's constant. So if I trace this graph from here to here, I notice that it's actually going downward. So from here to here, in this region right here, it's actually decreasing, OK? And if I want to write the interval for decreasing, 
it goes to the left forever because I'm supposed to be looking at X values. So it's left to right. X's are left to right. So it goes to the left little, little by little by little, but forever because of the arrow. So it does go toward the negative infinity X value. But it stops here at this X value, which is negative two. Now I know it's a solid dot and you want to put a bracket, but remember for intervals of increasing, decreasing, and constant, they always have parentheses. And so then we will do a parentheses around both sides. Then now I notice then here that if I keep tracing it, now it starts to go up, 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 up until it gets here, it's not going up anymore. So in this section, um, it's actually increasing because it's going up. So if I want the intervals for increasing, that's going to be from the leftmost x value to the rightmost point, right? So this x value is actually negative two. And then the x value that corresponds to where it stops is the x value of one. And again, I cannot use brackets for increasing, decreasing, or constant. So that will be a, uh, a parentheses on both ends. Then from here, if I keep tracing, it just goes straight. So that would be your constant region. And then for my constant interval, it actually starts going straight here, which the X value is one, but then it keeps going all the way this way. Well, what X value all goes all the way over there? That would be toward positive infinity. And so again, no brackets, just parentheses. Okay, and so now this is um, the end of this particular section. So there was another page on the back of this. I just want to let you know that we won't be doing any of these graph interpretations. Um, but we did actually finish uh, 2.3. So we did not get to start 5.2, but that's OK. Um, you should be able to do all of the problems for 2.3. So that one will still have the deadline of Friday. OK. Um, but for 5.2, we're not going to finish 5.2 until next week. So that one will probably not be due um, until next week. Okay. Hopefully we can finish it in an hour and 15 minutes. But if not, we can always push things over and then talk about 5.2 as much as we need to um, when we discuss the review for our first test. Okay. But we'll talk more about that when I see you guys on um, Tuesday. Okay. So you guys have a good weekend. Um, I apologize for the technical issues. I was not able to get them resolved, but um, I've been promised that we'll get resolved tomorrow. So I should be good to go by Tuesday. If not, I'm going to relocate um, to a different area. They did give me a second backup area to go to, okay? Um, so that's what we'll be doing. But thank you so much. And um, I will end this video. You have a good one. Bye-bye.